You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, award-winning volunteer for Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. Today is November 21st, 2021, and this is episode 148 of Lighthearted. In a few minutes, we'll listen to a conversation with Bonnie Stacy, chief curator of the Martha's Vineyard Museum in Massachusetts. Do you have any plans for Thanksgiving, Michelle? I actually do. We're going to some of my husband's family in Northampton, which is nice because last year we didn't really do anything for Thanksgiving, so it'll be nice to see some family this year. Well, my wife Charlotte and I will spend Thanksgiving with my brother and his partner in Boston. That's something we've uh, usually done in recent years. Looking forward to it. I wanted to tell our listeners about a Thanksgiving story related to Boone Island Lighthouse in Maine. Yes. Keeper William C. Williams was keeping watch in the lighthouse on the night before Thanksgiving when he heard a loud crash against the tower. He went outside and found several black ducks on the ground. According to the book Lighthouses of the Main Coast and the Men Who Keep Them by Robert Thayer Sterling, Williams and his assistant keepers have been wondering what they'd have for Thanksgiving dinner at the isolated light station, which is more than six miles from the nearest point on the mainland. According to Sterling, the birds were in fine condition and the men were very thankful for the blessing of an unexpected Thanksgiving feast. And also on November 21st, 1816, Point Gammon Lighthouse in West Yarmouth on Cape Cod in Massachusetts was lighted for the first time. The first keeper at Point Gammon, Samuel Adams Peak, died in 1824. His teenage son, John, took over and remained keeper until 1858, when the light was replaced by the Bishop and Clark's light offshore. This gives Point Gammon the distinction of having only two keepers, both from the same family. John Peake and his wife raised nine children at the lighthouse, two of whom became lighthouse keepers. And speaking of Cape Cod, our interview today is with Bonnie Stacy, the chief curator of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. Martha's Vineyard, as I'm sure many of our listeners know, is a large island just south of Cape Cod. I've been to the island, I don't know, probably dozens of times uh, at least over the years since I was around 10 years old. I had a chance to visit uh, this past October, last month, which is uh, when I recorded the interview we'll hear today. Michelle, please help me tell our listeners about the Martha's Vineyard Museum and our guest. Sure, Jeremy. Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, is the third largest island on the east coast of the United States, with a land area of about 96 square miles. The island was originally inhabited by the Wampanoag people, and there's still a substantial Wampanoag population in the town of Aquina at the island's western end. Martha's Vineyard was prominent in the whaling industry, and in the late 1800s, the island transitioned into a tourist destination. Five lighthouses were eventually established on the island, beginning with Gay Headlight in 1799. The Martha's Vineyard Museum was originally incorporated in the 1920s as the Dukes County Historical Society. In 1932, the Society purchased the Thomas Cook House in Edgartown to serve as its permanent headquarters. As the new collection grew, the museum expanded in the years that followed. A small tower was built on the museum grounds to display the 1854 Fresnel lens from Gay Head Lighthouse. The Society signed a long-term lease agreement with the Coast Guard to steward the Edgartown, East Chop, and Gay Head Lighthouses in 1992. The town of Aquina assumed ownership of Gay Head Lighthouse in 2018, but the museum continues to manage the other two. Realizing the need for more and better collection storage space, improved access, and additional space for exhibitions and public programming. The museum purchased the former 1895 Marine Hospital in Vineyard Haven in 2011. The museum opened in its new location in 2019. The museum's Flashes of Brilliance exhibit chronicles the history of lighthouses and navigation around the island. Set in the middle of the exhibit and spanning two floors like a suspended jewel, is the magnificent First Order Fresnel Lens from Gay Head Lighthouse. Bonnie Stacy is the chief curator of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. Her prior experience includes a stint as the curator of collections and exhibitions at the historic Bethlehem Partnership in Pennsylvania. 
I had been looking forward to visiting the new museum, and I finally had a chance to do that in October. So let's listen to my conversation with Bonnie Stacy now. I am here with Bonnie Stacy, who is the chief curator of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. So nice to be here. I'm very excited to see this museum for the first time today, and I'm very excited to be doing an interview in person for the first time in a couple of years since pre-pandemic. Thank you so much for being with me today, Bonnie. Well, welcome to the Martha's Vineyard Museum. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. I saw this place before it was uh, renovated and made into the museum. It's miraculous what's happened here. This is state of the art, you know, that you've moved into the 21st century in a, in a big way. So. We can certainly do a lot more here than we could when we were in Edgartown. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's really, really nice. So I want to talk, one of the main things I want to talk about is the, the beautiful first order Fresnel lens from the Gay Head Lighthouse that's on display here, which is, uh, well, maybe it's just because I'm a lighthouse buff, but I think it's kind of the centerpiece of the museum. I don't know if you agree with oh, that. Oh, no, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, both in terms of its size and its its beauty, I, I think. Yes. But we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But let me ask you first, uh, what actually led you to your position as curator at the Martha's Vineyard Museum? Well, it was kind of a roundabout uh, route that I took. Um, I My background is in American history and art history um, and the history of decorative arts. And those sort of all work together um, to allow me um, the experience that I needed to take on a job that has a broad focus. You think Martha's Vineyard is very narrow, but really it's uh, it's like a microcosm of the world here. Uh -huh. We have the, you know, this seed travel and farming and uh, fishing and all mm -hmm. sorts of things. And, and when you have that much of um, much content, a background in material culture is not a bad thing to have. It's mm -hmm. basically the history of stuff and how people use their things. And so it's not just what people did, but what people used. And so that was sort of my route here. I, I was uh, um, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania before here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I saw that Martha's Vineyard was looking for a curator, um, my family's from uh, Plymouth, so not uh, that far from here. And mm -hmm. uh, I've just thought I'd give it a try, and I've been here for 11 years. Mm -hmm. Great. So you're a stuffologist. That's in right. In other words, that's yeah. right. That's great. You're in the right right place. And yeah, I don't know if listeners realize how how big Martha's Vineyard is. It's a it's a pretty enormous island, and there's a lot of different aspects to it, as you say including tourism not being uh, the, one of the smallest. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of tourism here. It's a big part of the economy. And, um, you know, people come and they want to learn about Martha's Vineyard. It's culture, it's history, it's natural phenomena. And the museum is a great place to come to get introduced to that. And mm -hmm. then and then we like to think that we're sort of sending them on their way to look at the rest of the island and explore because there's so much to see. Yeah, well, it seems like a, a perfect place for people to start their, their visit here. So I uh, recall the old museum in Edgartown fondly. I was there a number of times looking at the, the gay head lens there and the exhibits and uh, did some research there, I think maybe 20 or so years ago, maybe maybe closer to 30. I don't know. It was, it was a while ago, but... Uh, I remember spending a couple of days in the library there. So you began working there before uh, the museum came to its new location here. I'm sure as curator you were involved in the planning for the new site. And I, uh, as we mentioned, the Gay Head Lens, of course, is a centerpiece. I understand there was actually some special design work that was done to accommodate the lens. That must have been fun. Uh, yeah, it was. And the lens is in an addition. The, the museum, uh, the main part of the museum is an 1895 um, United States Marine Hospital mm -hmm. that has been renovated into a museum. Um, but for the Fresnel, we we designed a whole pavilion edition around it. Mm -hmm. When you when you look at it, you can see that it is definitely the the focal point of the space, and um, that gave us room to interpret it and for people to get many different views of it. But it, you know, because it has so many large parts. 
Um, there's a big central shaft, mm-hmm. um, and there are, um, I think it's a 1,008 prisms, but they mm-hmm. are fitted into, um, into sections. Right. Um, but, but as far as designing the building, uh, one of the things that happened was we thought the elevator was going to be fine to, to move that central shaft in. But when it came down to the final measurement, um, it was not big enough. Uh-huh. And so we had to move that central shaft in with heavy equipment um, that would basically su- um, suspend it into the middle of the room and down and then um, build a, you know, they the contractors built a, a case around it to make sure that it wasn't damaged during the rest of the construction. Mm-hmm. But that was not even, you know, the first part of the process. Um, back when we were planning the move, Um, we hired Jim Woodward to come in and tell us what was going to be um, required in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And he did a detailed proposal of exactly what it would would take, which is basically taking it apart, packing it, cleaning it before it gets packed up. The metal parts had to be sent to a metal conservator, Mm -hmm. uh, and then they had to come back. And this all had to be timed precisely right. to happen and um, and the reassembly to happen at the point where the, the building was at the right phase of construction. And mm-hmm. so it was very complex. We, we were very fortunate to get um, an Institute for Museum and Library Services grant for the move of the Fresnel, for the move and conservation and reassembly of the Fresnel lens because it was a, it was quite a costly project that, um, but we were um, able to make the case that this is such an important piece um, that it was worthy of funding. And so that sure. was very gratifying. Yeah, I'm glad that worked out. So you were in very good hands with Jim Woodward. He's the best. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's the dean of uh, the Lampus and their uh, rare breed. There's only around a half dozen certified Lampus, uh, these Guys, I, I use the word guys advisedly because there are there are no women lampists. There should be. Uh, I didn't but, I didn't see any in his crew. So, right. Yeah. yeah. There there certainly could be and should be, but he is kind of the dean of the the lampus, the the uh, Fresnel lens uh, restoration and moving <laughs> experts. Yeah, we were very uh, confident um, choosing him because he's so knowledgeable and skilled. Yeah. Oh, he's Jim is Jim is great. Uh, so would you like to maybe describe a little bit more about the actual process of moving the lens into the space? Yeah. So as I said, there was a lot of timing coordination. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, maybe six to eight months before that, uh, Jim and his crew came, disassembled the lens, cleaned all of the glass pieces and crated them mm-hmm. and s- stored them on our old site. And then... When it, it and in sort of in the middle, when we were at the construction point where we needed to get that big giant piece back into the building, mm-hmm. you know, we had to coordinate with uh, the people who operate the, the equipment, and he sent uh, one of his crew members um, to supervise the installation into the building, mm-hmm. and it was it was quite a process. It was um, you know basically just making sure that it all balanced correctly and it, it moved over right into the center where it was going to go down. But we we couldn't put any of the windows in before this happened since it you know it just wouldn't wouldn't work that any other mm-hmm, way. Mm-hmm. And so that was. Um, that was sort of the middle of the process. And then they built the building around that piece. And when it came time to, which was probably a month or so before the building was really reaching its most finished point, Mm -hmm. the whole crew came back and um, we moved everything back, you know, from Edgartown, all of the, the lens pieces and everything that had been in storage, um, that wasn't metal because that had all been, you know, kind of coordinated to return at the same time as well from Boston where it was being done. It was mm-hmm. um, uh, dataless conservation labs mm-hmm. worked on that. So it all kind of arrived around the same time and they put it all together. Um, we have films of, of them working. 
Um, it was it was really amazing to watch the way that they were so skilled in fitting that all together. It was really impressive. And then we had to tent the whole thing so that the construction dust that was still happening wouldn't get all over the lens because we just had it cleaned. It was, you know, it was really in, it was just in pristine condition. And the idea of having to then go back in and get all of the, the dust off of it um, mm. was not something anybody wanted to do. So, <laughs> so we we tented the whole thing and um, taped it up and uh, kept it kept it clean. Yeah, well, it looks looks like it was just manufactured. Now it looks <laughs> so pristine, so beautiful. And I certainly maybe I didn't look at it from, from an inch away, but I certainly didn't detect any dust when I just looked at it. Does somebody dust it on occasion? <laughs> You know, it, not as often as we ought to. You probably were, were just not looking closely enough. It's one of those things that, you know, we go in and do periodically. You have to do it just right. Um, yeah. You know, dust is an abrasive. So, um, you know, it's best not to let it build up. But uh, on the other hand, it, it's a pretty durable piece. Um, it was certainly um, subjected to harsher, much harsher conditions than it's going to get here, including back in Eggertown where it it wasn't in a climate controlled area right. and the base was was severely corroded. But it, you know, we were we were brought it back to its original green paint color anyway. The, mm-hmm. It had been painted, you know, a, a couple of times the wrong color. One of Woody's triumphs was finding the original paint color um, on an inside surface of the lens so that we could confidently, he knew what color it was supposed to be, and then he actually found the evidence for uh-huh. that color. And so it was really gratifying to be able to bring that back to the way it originally looked. Sure, sure. Fresnel lenses were uh, state-of-the-art technology in the 1800s was one of the most important inventions of the the century. But I also like to call Fresnel lenses uh, works of functional art Mm -hmm. because they're so beautiful. Uh, Would you care to comment on that? Any any aspects of the lens that you think are especially uh, appealing or interesting? Well, you know, I, I think that you sort of hit both of the main points right there because This particular lens was exhibited at at the um, Paris Exhibition Universal in uh, 1852, four? Anyway, it was right around the time it was made. It was first Mm -hmm. in Paris, and then it was shipped here. And so even though, you, you know, it kind of wasn't meant to be looked at up close, its first sort of introduction to the world was exactly as an exhibit in an exposition right. and super beautiful. But I think it also kind of goes to the, um, the way a lot of times um, machinery was, you know, just sort of, I don't know whether it was designed to be beautiful, but it certainly turned out that way. And, um, and people are so impressed with it when they see it here. um, Because of its size, it is first order. So it's as big as they come. Mm -hmm. And also just because of its, um, its, its aesthetic impressiveness. Um, You know, you mentioned that, that, you know, it, it, it can be exhibited with the beams coming out, et cetera. We tend to occasionally, you know, for an event or something, we'll do that. But because that's sort of not the way it was um, originally meant to be seen, and it doesn't really tell the story of its function, Mm -hmm. for the most part, we show it without a light in it um, because the light was not meant to be seen this close up. It was meant to be seen, you know, 16, 20 miles out to sea, you know, whatever, whatever the focal point was, but um, yeah. not, not as the, you know, kind of um, beautiful sculpture in the middle of the room. Right. But I love it both ways, actually. Mm-hmm. And we do have interpretive material that talks about, mm-hmm. you know, the optics of it and the, um, you know the the signaling pattern of it. Um, you know, so so people can can really get whatever they want out of it. If they want to just look at something beautiful and have their picture taken in front mm-hmm. of it, we encourage that. And yeah. if they want to know more, there's plenty to learn. Yeah, there is. I actually, until I saw it today, I didn't realize you do have as much, as many exhibits related to the, the lens, including uh, some of the human history, with Charles Vanderhoop and everything. That's right. Um, so it's, it's great to see. It's uh, 
if it was by itself, it wouldn't be just a lens. It's a, it's a, it's a spectacular lens, but it's really nice to see that you're showing the, the different uh, aspects. Yeah, things. I think one of the things that um, is is really wonderful about this and, and about, you know, you mentioned Charles Vanderhoop, is he was the first Wampanoag keeper of the lens, which of course was up um, in Gayhead originally, which is now a Quinna and was a Quinna before it was Gayhead. The Wampanoag people have a very strong affinity for that lighthouse and for this lens. And the history of the Wampanoag is sort of all tied up in this. And so we do try to um, interpret that story both uh, with with uh, the story of Vanderhoop and also even the, um, the souvenirs that were created around the lighthouse, which were made by Wampanoag people. Mm-hmm. It, there's like a whole separate little exhibit area that talks about, about the Gayhead lighthouse itself. Right. Yeah, the, the Wampanoag uh, history on that part of the island is so tied in with it. I understand, and I think it was especially after the, the lighthouse was rebuilt and with the beautiful new lens and everything in 1854, uh, and uh, that the uh, some of the Wampanoag Indians would take tourists to see the lighthouse in ox carts. That's right. That's pretty neat. Yeah, um, yeah. There yeah. was a lot of photographs of people standing in mm-hmm. front of the... Um, of the lighthouse and yeah. with the ox carts and everything, and it's you know famous people, and uh, yeah. it's it's really it's really interesting. So, in addition to the the lighthouse lens and exhibits around it, uh, I think you know a lot of our listeners are maritime buffs in general, and you've got some other exhibits related to maritime history. We do in the museum. Yeah, and and it's kind of woven throughout the museum. Yeah. Our introductory exhibit is called One Island, Many Stories, which is arranged thematically. And one of the themes is voyaging that talks about whaling and and the coastal schooners and um, that sort of thing. And then um, we also have an exhibit called The Challenge of the Sea, which goes into some of the... Um, the issues faced by people living um, on the water, near the water, using the water for their as their trade. It has navigation, which of course, uh, when you when you look at that exhibit, that's on the lower level of the p- pavilion that the Fresnel is in. And so the lighthouse is, is or the lens is is in both exhibits. It's in mm-hmm. on the upper on the upper floor. You can see the prisms and the the beautiful glass part of the, the lens. And when you're down on the the lower level, um, you really get more of the navigation story and how the lens works and that sort of thing, along with areas that talk about um, a couple of the famous shipwrecks, uh, the city of Columbus and the Port Hunter, and um, things about the storms and life-saving and um, navigation. So those are sort of the themes that are woven throughout Mm -hmm. that exhibition. And then right now, we have an exhibit up on Scrimshaw, which isn't really, um, I mean, it's maritime, but it's really, you know, it's, it's art and it's, it's, all, it's, it's, there's some beautiful stuff there. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and the nice thing about that exhibit is it's in what we call our cabinet of curiosities. Mm. So mm. it's a much more densely packed than many of our other exhibits. It's just like, look at all this cool stuff we have. You're not going to believe how many beautiful things we have here. See? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's sort of. <laughs> yeah, that's more in the style of a lot of older museums, where there's just a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, maybe not even related to to each other. You know? There's some interpretation there. Mm-hmm. The, the Kate Logue, who curated the exhibit, um, did a good job about talking about the um, the people who who made who made the scrimshaw and why they would have been doing it and you know why does some of this stuff so much better than some of the other of it and it's because not everybody was good at it but everybody well not everybody did it but a lot of people did it whether they were good at it or not and right. so we have a wide yeah. variety yeah um a lot of it's what you call folk well i guess all of it you would call folk art um yeah but, it's it's uh yeah and you know things that people would bring back to their sweetheart um all mm-hmm. sorts of um, really cool stuff uh, so let's talk about the other uh, lighthouses the the uh, Martha's Vineyard Museum is is involved with and goes back I think about thirty years mm-hmm. that the museum uh, at the, I think at the early part of that it was known as the Duke's County 
Museum or Deuce County Historical Deuce Society. Deuce County Historical Society and then the Martha's Vineyard Historical Society. And, mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. I remember, yes. remember all that, trying to keep it straight. Mm-hmm. But it's been the Martha's Vineyard Museum for a while now. And uh, the museum has been the steward of the Edgartown and East Chop Lighthouses. But I understand Edgar, the town of Edgartown actually owns the Edgartown Lighthouse now. Mm-hmm. Um, but the museum continues to kind of interpret it. And So the Edgartown Light, we open during the summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we provide um, a staff person there who lets people in to give them some of the history of the light. Um, and then it's so it's open all summer. And then weekends as we move into the fall. I mean, mm-hmm. and it, I think it starts with weekends in the spring. Um, so okay. that's the Eggertown light. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's actually open every day during the summer. Yes. Right. It's that's, very popular for people yeah. who are just at the beach and they want to, you know, they're, sure. they're sort of like, hey, let's go up there. It's a beautiful view. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've been yeah. in it. It is. And, you know, um, the museum, I, I'm obviously, you know, but I think it was about 2007, the museum had a restoration done of that lighthouse. Mm-hmm. And before that, as you might know, there was just a ladder inside the lighthouse from the bottom up into the lantern room. And my friend, Simon Ponsart Roberts, who I wrote a book with, who grew up at West Chop Lighthouse and Cuddy Hunk before that, she, her father had to go uh, check on the Edgartown Lighthouse sometimes. And she said, to, you know, as a little girl, sometimes she would climb that ladder. It was a little scary, but it was like unlike any other lighthouse. And uh, the museum had an actual spiral stairway, probably very similar to what had been there. Mm-hmm. But, of course, that lighthouse was moved from another uh, place on the mainland, uh, yeah. Ipswich, Mass. That's right. Um, so I don't think a stairway came with it. That's why there was a ladder there. Yeah. yeah. But it's nice to see a stairway back in there. Yeah. Um, so that's a, it's a great lighthouse to visit. And East Chop Lighthouse, I know there's some issues right now that I think are prevent, is preventing tours. Is that right? Yes. Um, it, it, there's some lead contamination, I believe, from it just being painted over and over again. That's generally the way that happens. That's being remediated now. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's not under control of the museum. That's uh, uh, the town of Oak Bluffs and the Coast Guard are doing that. And right. uh, once that happens... We will be, you know, it'll be open to the public again. Not as the hours are generally not as extensive as mm-hmm. Edgar Town. There's not as much parking around there. Right. But usually, in the past, it's been open on, um, you know, in the evenings on the weekends, I believe. But I don't know what the hours are going to be. I would say that's a keep an eye on our website to find out how that's going to be. But we expect it'll be open again next summer. I hope. Martha's Vineyard is definitely a. A mecca for lighthouse lovers. Yeah. Uh, Gay Head is, is is really spectacular, but the others are, are very much worth visiting. Edgar Town's in a really pretty setting. It's nice, yeah. It is really nice to yeah. visit, yeah. Uh, and if you stay around Edgar Town, you can walk from anywhere in town down to the lighthouse. It's always a always a nice walk. Yeah. And speaking of Edgar Town Lighthouse, I, I saw there's a, a nice virtual exhibit on the uh, museum's website about that with a lot of historical photos and information. That was that was really nice to see. Yeah, yeah, that was that started out as an in-person exhibit, a temporary exhibit, and um, also curated by Kate Logue, who's the same one who did this Grimshaw exhibit. And so once that came down, it mm-hmm. really translated well into an online exhibit, mm-hmm. and um, and so that's why we decided to to give that further life as an online exhibit. So let me ask you a general question about the lighthouses. What do you think the lighthouses of Martha's Vineyard mean to the people of Martha's Vineyard? I think they're very important. Um, you know, they they really drive home the, the fact that we are an island. The history of the island, it was on a major maritime thoroughfare where these were extremely important. Now, when you, you think of GPS, you don't realize how very important these beacons were to navigation. Um, but... I think that they're they're sort of a tangible tie to the history of the island and their landmarks. So that's the other thing is that people are they they see them and they they know that they're home um, and it and so I think that that's part of the the draw of the lighthouses to Martha's Vineyard. Now everybody has their own sort of feelings about them, but in general, I think it just. It's something that is sort of different. There, there are you know five of them, and uh, it's it's part of the island. Mm-hmm. Well, that 
sums it up beautifully. I think you, you covered it all there. So I have one final question for you for bonus points. Okay. <laughs> what do you like most about the work you do at the Martha's Vineyard Museum? I love the enthusiasm of the people who work here and the people who come here. The enthusiasm for for the island, the enthusiasm for their history. Um, we all are sort of trying to broaden and deepen what we are doing. Um, and we're trying to include people who perhaps were less visible in the past, but they're there. And, and so the excitement of finding all of this new information and getting it in front of the public in a way that they perhaps didn't even realize that they were missing um, is really exciting and it's what we're doing right now and um, and so I would say that that is what I'm enjoying the most right now is just the ability to mine the collection and mine the memories of people so that we can broaden their understanding of the place where they live. And, you know, of course, not everybody who comes to the museum actually lives on the island, but um, I have found that the things that appeal to the people who live here are generally the same things that appeal to people who visit. Mm -hmm. Uh, So many people come to this island, especially in the summer, obviously. Uh, I hope people put it on their itinerary, and uh, it's a great starting point to learn about, uh, get an overview of the place and its history and everything. Yeah, and, and certainly, obviously, lighthouse buffs have to come here. Absolutely. And we are open year-round. And mm-hmm. um, so if you find yourself in, you know, nearby, it's the, the ferry ride is uh, is not that difficult. We're within walking distance of the, the ferry in Vineyard Haven. Right. Um, and so um, I would, you know, obviously check the website first, like we're closed on Mondays. And I hate it when I see people who walk up the hill and they're Mm. like, oh, it's Monday and they're sad. Um, But, you know, for the most part, you know, you're, you're likely to find us open during the day. And I would, I would recommend that people look at our website because you may just luck out and find us open. We're open year round. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good to know. And uh, for people who can't make it here in person, there's the website, there's some interesting things on there. There's also uh, I believe a YouTube channel. That's right. With some neat videos, including an interview with uh, Charles Vanderhoop Jr., the son of uh, the longtime keeper Charles Vanderhoop at Gayhead Lighthouse. Mm-hmm. And I was just checking that out the other day. So there's some some good stuff to look at there yeah. too. Yeah, lots of oral histories, mm-hmm. um, not just lighthouses, but all over the place. Um, and, but quite a bit from lighthouse related folks, and uh, you know some some programs. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot on the YouTube channel. Yeah. Well, all in all, you're doing a fantastic job. It's, I'm really excited to finally be here. After and I actually, I've come to Martha's Vineyard. I was trying to think maybe 20 or 25 times, maybe a bit more than that. I'm not sure. But, you know, remember quite a few times over the years and went to that old museum several times. And uh, it was great. But this is this is just amazing. Well, thank you. So thank you so much for hosting me today. Thank you for your time. I'll keep up the good work. Hope to visit you again. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. (laughs) To learn more about the Martha's Vineyard Museum and to view their online exhibits, visit mvmuseum.org. We didn't talk about it in the interview, but the cookhouse in Edgartown, which was part of the old Martha's Vineyard Museum, is now known as the Cookhouse and Legacy Gardens. Different parts of the garden represent different eras, including a colonial garden with native medicinal plants. Another thing we should mention is that the Martha's Vineyard Museum has two YouTube channels with lots of oral history interviews and other videos. Just search YouTube for the MV Museum and look for the museum's main channel, and also the MV Museum Oral History Channel. And as I talked about with Bonnie, the museum makes an excellent first stop for anyone visiting Martha's Vineyard, especially anyone interested in lighthouses. The lens exhibit is really excellent. On the next episode of Lighthearted, we're featuring an interview about White Island Lighthouse in the Isles of Shoals off the New Hampshire coast. The light station is celebrating its 200th anniversary this year. According to an old Chinese proverb, and I quote, If there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. 
If there is beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. If there is harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. If there is order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. End quote. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light.